Technique. I should say, quote, technique, end quote. What the fuck? I fucked up the, the tweeting of it, goddammit. Once again. Okay. Two twelve to two twenty seven. Two twenty. speak into the laptop. <clears throat> the aesthetic name for mastery over material, technique, a borrowing from antiquity, which ranked the arts among artisanal activities, is of recent date in its present acceptation. It bears the traces of a phase in which, analogous to science, methods were considered to be independent of their object. In retrospect, alt artistic procedures that form the material and allow themselves to be guided by it coalesce under the technological aspect, including those procedures that originated in the artisanal praxis of the medieval production of goods, a praxis from which art, resisting integration into capitalism, never completely diverged. In art, the threshold between craft and technique is not, as in material production, a strict quantification of processes, 
which is incompatible with art's qualitative telos. Nor is it the introduction of machines, rather it is the predominance of conscious free control over the aesthetic means, in contrast to traditionalism under the cover of which the control matured. Vis-a-vis -vis content, the technical aspect is only one aspect among many others. No artwork is nothing but the quintessence of its technical elements. That any view of artwork that perceives nothing but how they are made falls short of aesthetic experience is admittedly a standard apologetic topos preferred by cultural ideology. Yet it nevertheless remains true in opposition to the functionalist view of art at the point where functionalism is forsaken. Technique is, however, constitutive of art because in it is condensed the fact that each artwork is a human artifact and that what is artistic in it becomes a human product. Technique and content must be distinguished. What is ideological is the abstraction that extracts the supra-technical from what is purportedly merely technique, as if in important works, technique and content did not produce each other reciprocally. Shakespeare's nominalistic breakthrough into mortal and infinitely rich individuality as content is as much a function of an anti-tectonic quasi-epic succession of short scenes as this episodic technique is under the control of the content. A metaphysical experience that explodes the meaning-giving order of the old unities. In the priestly word message, the dialectical relation of content and technique is reified as a simple dichotomy. Technique has key significance for the knowledge of art. It alone leads reflection to the interior of works though of course only on condition that one speak their language. Because the content is not something made, technique does not circumscribe art as a whole, yet it is exclusively from its concretion that the content can be extrapolated. Technique is the definable figure of the enigma in artworks, at once rational and conceptless. It authorizes judgment in a region that does not make judgments. Certainly the technical questions of artworks become infinitely complex and cannot be solved on the basis of a single maxim. Yet in principle, they can be imminently decided. Technique as the measure of the logic of works is also the measure of the suspension of logic. The surgical excision of technique would suit a vulgar mentality, but it would be false. For the technique of a work is constituted by its problems, by the apparatic task that, is objective, that it objectively poses to itself. It is only with regard to this problem that the technique of a work can be discerned and the question answered as to whether or not it suffices, just as inversely the objective problem of the work must be inferred from its technical complexion. If no work can be understood without an understanding of its technique, Technique, conversely, cannot be understood without an understanding of the work. The degree to which, beyond the specification of a particular work, a technique is universal or monadological varies historically, yet even in idolized eras, when style was binding, technique had the responsibility of assuring that style did not abstractly rule the work but entered into the dialectic of the work's individuation. How much more significant technique is than art alien irrationalism, would like to admit, is obvious in that, presupposing the capacity for the experience of art, experience unfolds all the more richly the more deeply consciousness penetrates the artwork's technical complexion. Understanding grows along with an understanding of the technical treatment of the work. That consciousness kills is a nursery tale, only false consciousness is fatal. Metier initially makes art commensurable to consciousness because, for the most part, it can be learned. What a teacher finds fault with in a student's work is the first model of a lack of métier. Corrections are the model of métier itself. These models are pre-artistic insofar as they recapitulate pre-established patterns and rules. They take a step beyond this when they become the comparison of technical means with the sought-after goal. A primitive level of education, beyond which, admittedly, the usual study of composition really goes, 
The teacher finds fault with parallel fifths and in their place suggests better voice leading. But if it is not a pedant, you will demonstrate to the student that parallel fifths are legitimate artistic means for intended effects, as in Debussy, and they are external to tonality, and that external to tonality, the prohibition loses its meaning altogether. Métier ultimately sloughs off its provisional limited shape. The experienced eye that surveys a score or a drawing ascertains almost mimetically before any analysis, whether the objet d'art ha has métier and innervates its level of form. Yet this does not suffice. An account is necessary of the work's métier, which appears as a breath, the aura of artworks, in strange contrast to the dilettante's image of artistic skill. The oratic element, paradoxically apparent and bound up with métier, is the memory of the hand that tenderly, almost caressingly, passed over the contours of the work and by articulating them also mollified them. This relation of aura and métier can be brought out by analysis, which in itself lodged in métier, which is itself lodged in métier. In contrast to the synthesizing function of artworks, which is familiar to all, the analytical element is strangely ignored. Its locus is the counterpole to synthesis. That is, it focuses on the economy of the elements out of which the work is composed. Yet no less than synthesis, it inheres objectively in the artwork. The conductor, who analyzes a work in order to perform it adequately rather than mimicking it, recapitulates a precondition of the possibility of the work itself. Analysis provides clues to a higher concept of métier. In music, for instance, the flow of a piece is concerned with whether it is thought in individual measures or in phrases that reach over and above them, or whether impulses are followed through and pursued rather than being left to peter out in patchwork. Movement in the concept of technique provides the true gratis ad parnassum. Only in the course of an aesthetic casuistry, however, does this become completely evident. When Alban Berg answered in the negative the naive question whether Strauss was not to be admired at least for his technique, he pointed out the arbitrariness of Strauss's method, which carefully calculates a series of effects without seeing to it that, in purely musical terms, one event emerges from or is made requisite by another. This technical critique of highly technical works obviously disregards a conception of composition that asserts the principle of shock as a fundamental and actually transfers the unity of the composition into the irrational suspension of what traditional style called logicality, unity. It could be argued that this concept of technique ignores the imminence of the works of the work and has external origins, specifically in the ideal of a school that, like Schoenberg's, anachronistically maintains the idea of developing variation a vestige of traditional musical logic in order to mobilize it against tradition. But this argument avoids the actual artistic issue. Berg's critique of Strauss's métier hits the mark because whoever refuses logic is incapable of the elaboration of the work that serves that métier to which Strauss himself was committed. True, already in Berlioz, the leaps and the breaks and leaps of the imprévu were sought after. They at the same time disrupt the thrust of the music's course, which is replaced by the thrusting gesture. Music organized in such temporal dynamic fashion as that of Strauss is incompatible with a compositional method that does not coherently organize temporal succession. Ends and means are contradictory. The contradiction cannot be assuaged simply within the realm of means but instead extends to the goal itself, the glorification of contingency, which celebrates as an unencumbered life something that is no more than the anarchy of commodity production and the brutality of those who control it. There's a false concept of continuity implicit in the view of artistic technique as a straight line of progress independent from content. Movements espousing the liberation of technique are capable of being affected by the untruth of the content. Just how inwardly technique and content, contrary to accepted opinion, 
are mutually defining was expressed by Beethoven when he said that many of the effects that are commonly attributed to the natural genius of the composer are in truth due to the adroit use of the diminished seventh chord. The dignity of such sober assessment condemns all the chatter about creativity. Beethoven's objectivity was the first time justice was done equally to aesthetic illusion and the illusionless. The recognition of inconsistencies between technique and artwork's intention, especially its expressive mimetic dimension and its truth content sometimes provokes revolts against technique. Self-emancipation at the price of its goal is endogenous to the concept of technique. It has a propensity to become an end in itself as a sort of contentless proficiency. Fauvism was a reaction against this in painting. The analogous reaction in music was the rise of Schoenberg's free atonality in opposition to the orchestral brilliance of the Neue Deutsch School. In his essay, Problems in Teaching Art, Schoenberg, who more than any other musician of his epoch insisted on consistent craftsmanship, expressly attacked blind faith in technique. Reified technique sometimes provokes correctives that border on the wild, the barbaric, the technically primitive, and art alien. What can truly be called modern art was hurled out by this primitive impulse, which, because it could not domesticate itself, transformed itself at every point once again into technique. Yet this impulse was in no way regressive. Technique is not an abundance of means, but rather the accumulated capacity to be suited to what the object itself demands. The idea of technique is sometimes better served by the reduction of means than by piling it up and exhausting the work. Schoenberg's economical piano pieces, Op. 11, with all the wonderful ungainliness of their innovativeness, are technically superior to the orchestration of Strauss's Heldenleben, of which only a part of the score is acoustically perceptible. Here, the means are no longer adequate even to their most immediate end, the sounding appearance of what is imagined. It is possible that the mature Schoenberg second technique, the 12 tone system, fell short of what was achieved by the earlier act of suspension involved in his first technique, atonality. But even the emancipation of technique, which draws technique into its particular dialectic, is not simply the original sin of routine, which is how it appears to the unalloyed need for expression. Because of its close bond with content, technique has a legitimate life of its own. In the process of change, art habitually finds itself in need of those elements that it was previously obliged to renounce. This neither explains nor excuses the fact that to date, artistic revolutions have been reactionary, but it is certainly bound up with it. Prohibitions, including the prohibition on luxuriating plenitude and complexity, have a regressive aspect. This is one of the reasons why prohibition, however saturated it may be with refusal, ultimately collapses. This constitutes one of the dimensions in the process of objectivation. When some 10 years after World War II, composers had had enough of post weberian pointillism, a striking example of which is Boulez's Marteau Saint Maître. The process repeated itself, this time as the critique of the ideology of any absolute new beginning, of starting out with a clean slate. Four decades earlier, the transition from Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon to synthetic cubism may have had a related meaning. The same historical experiences are expressed in the rise and fall of technical allergies as are expressed in the content. In this, content communicates with technique. Kant's idea of purposefulness, which, as he conceived it, established the connection between art and the interior of nature, is most closely related to technique. Technique is that whereby artworks are organized as purposeful in a way that is denied to empirical existence. Only through technique do they become purposeful. Because of its sobriety, the emphasis on technique in art alienates Philistines. It makes art's provenance and prosaic praxis of which art stands in horror, all too obvious. Nowhere does art make itself so guilty, 
be so guilty of illusoriness as in the irrevocable technical aspect of its sorcery. For only through technique, the medium of art's crystallization, does art distance itself from the prosaic. Technique ensures that the artwork is more than an agglomeration of what is factually available, and this more is art's content. In the language of art, expressions like technique, métier, and crafts are synonyms. This points up that anachronistic aspect of craft that Valéry's melancholy did not overlook. It admixes something idyllic with art's existence in an age in which nothing true is any longer permitted to be harmless. On the other hand, however, whenever autonomous art has seriously set out to absorb industrial processes, they have remained external to it. Mass reproduction has in no way become its imminent law of form to the extent that identification with the aggressor would like to suggest. Even in film, industrial and aesthetic craftsmen-like elements diverge under socioeconomic pressure. The radical industrialization of art, its undiminished adaptation to the achieved technical standards, collides with what in art resists integration. If technique strives for industrialization as its vanishing point, it does so at the cost of the imminent elaboration of the work and thus at the cost of technique itself. This instills into art an archaic element that comprom compromises it. The fantastic predilection that generations of youth have had for jazz unconsciously protests against this and at the same time manifests the implicit contradiction for production that adapts to industry or, at the least, acts as if it had done so, falls helplessly behind the artistic compositional forces of production in terms of its own aesthetic complexion. The current tendency, evident in media of all kinds, to manipulate accident is probably an effort to avoid old-fashioned and effectively superfluous craftsmanlike methods in art without delivering art over to the instrumental rationality of mass production. The suspicious question as to art in the age of technology, as unavoidable as it is a socially naive slogan of the epoch, can be approached only by reflection on the relation of artworks to purposefulness. Certainly, artworks are defined by technique as something that is purposeful in itself. The works Terminus ad Chem, however, has its locus exclusively in itself, not externally. Therefore, the technique of its imminent purposefulness also remains without a purpose whereas technique itself constantly has extra aesthetic technique as its model. Kant's paradoxical formulation expresses an antinomical relation, though the antinomist did not make it explicit. In the process of becoming increasingly technical, which irrevocably blind, binds them to functioning forms, artworks come into contradiction with their purposelessness. In applied arts, products are, for example, adapted to the streamlined form that serves to reduce air resistance, even though the chairs will not be meeting with this resistance. Applied arts are, however, a prophetic warning for art, art's irrevocably rational element, which is concentrated as its technique works against art. It is not that rationality kills the unconscious, the substance of art or whatever, Technique alone made art capable of admitting the unconscious into itself, but precisely by virtue of its absolute autonomy, the rational, purely elaborated artwork would annul its difference from empirical existence. Without imitating it, the artwork would assimilate itself to its opposite, the commodity. It would be indistinguishable from completely functional works, except that it would have no purpose, and this admittedly would speak against it. The totality of inner aesthetic purposefulness develops into the problem of art's purposefulness beyond its own sphere, a problem for which it has no answer. The judgment holds that the strictly technical artwork comes to ruin, and those works that restrict their own technique are inconsequential. If technique is the quintessence of art's language, it is at the same time inescapably it at the same time inescapably, inescapably liquidates its language. In art, no less than in other domains, the concept of the technical force of production cannot be fetishized. 
Otherwise, it would become a reflex of that technocracy that is a form of domination socially disguised under the semblance of rationality. Technical forces of production have no value in themselves. They receive their importance exclusively in relation to their purpose in the work and ultimately in relation to the truth content of what has been written, composed, or painted. Of course, such purposefulness of technical means in art is not transparent. Purpose often hides in technology without the latter's adequacy to the purpose being immediately ascertainable. Thus, the discovery and rapid development of instrumental technique in the early 19th century bore the technocratic traces of Saint Simonian de technocracy. How this instrumental integration of works in all their dimensions was, relative, was related to purpose only became evident at a later stage and at that point, once again, qualitatively transformed orchestral technique. In art, the entwinement of purpose and technical means is an admonition for the circumspect invocation of categorical, of categorical judgments on their quid pro quo. Likewise, it is uncertain whether adaptation to an extra aesthetic technique necessarily amounts inner aesthetically to progress. This could hardly be claimed in the case of the Symphonie Fantastique appendant to early world fairs in comparison with the contemporaneous late work of Beethoven. Beginning in those years, the erosion of subjective mediation, which almost always accompanies technologization, took its toll on music, as is evident in the lack of real compositional elaboration in Berlioz's work. The technological artwork is by no means a priori more consistent than that which, in response to industrialization, turns inward, intent on producing the effect of an effect without a cause. What hits the mark in the various reflections on art in what journalists call the technological age, which is just as much marked by the social relations of production as by the level of productive forces, is not so much the adequacy of art to technical developments as the transformation of the experiential forms sedimented in artworks. The question is that of the aesthetic world of imagery. Pre-industrial imagery irretrievably had to collapse. The sentence with which Benjamin's reflections on surrealism began, it, is no, it no longer feels right to dream about the blue flower, gets to the heart of the matter. Art is mimesis of the world of imagery, and at the same time it's enlightenment through forms of control. The world of imagery, itself thoroughly historical, is done an injustice by the fiction of a world of images that effaces the relations in which people live. The utilization of available technical means in accord with the critical consciousness of art does not offer a solution to the problem whether and how art is possible that, as an uneducable innocence thinks of it, would be relevant in today's world. On the contrary, any solution demands the authenticity of a form of experience that does not lay claim to an immediacy it has lost. A immediacy of aesthetic comportment is exclusively an immediate relationship to the universally mediated. That today any walk in the woods, unless elaborate plans have been made to seek out the most remote forests, is accompanied by the sound of jet engines overhead, not only destroys the actuality of nature as, for instance, an object of poetic celebration, it affects the mimetic impulse. Nature poetry is anachronistic not only as a subject, its truth content has vanished. This may help clarify the anorganic aspect of Beckett's as well as of Kellan's poetry. It yearns neither for nature nor for industry. It is precisely the integration of the latter that leads to poetizes, poetization, which was already a dimension of Impressionism, and contributes its part to making peace with an unpeaceful world. Art, as an anticipatory form of reaction, is no longer able, if it ever was, to embody a pristine nature or the industry that has scorched it. The impossibility of both is probably the hidden law of aesthetic non-representationalism. The images of the post-industrial world are those of a corpse. They want to avert atomic war by banning it, just as 40 years ago, surrealism sought to save Paris through the image of cows grazing in the streets, the same cows after which the people of bombed out Berlin rebaptized 
Kurfürstendamm as Kudam. In relation to its telos, all aesthetic technique falls under the shadow of irrationality, which is the opposite of that for which aesthetic irrationalism criticizes technique, and this shadow is anathema to technique. Of course, an element of universality cannot be eliminated from technique any more than from the movement of nominalism as a whole. Cubism and composition with 12 tones related only to one another are, in terms of their idea, universal procedures in the age of the negation of aesthetic universality, the tension between objectivating technique and the mimetic essence of artworks is fought out in the effort to save the fleeting, the ephemeral, the transitory in a form that is immune to reification and yet akin to it in being permanent. It is probably only in this Sisyphean struggle that the concept of artistic technique took shape, it is akin to the tour de force, this is the focal point of Valéry's theory, a rational theory of aesthetic irrationality. Incidentally, art's impulse to objectivate the fleeting, not the permanent, may well run through the whole of its history. Hegel failed to recognize this, and for this reason, in the midst of dialectics, failed to recognize the temporal core of art's truth content. The subjectivization of art throughout the 19th century, which at the same time unbound its technical forces of production, did not sacrifice the objective idea of art, but rather, by bringing it fully into time, set it in sharper, purer relief than any classicist purity ever achieved. Thus, the greatest justice that was done to the mimetic impulse becomes the greatest injustice, because permanence, objectivation, ultimately negates the mimetic impulse. Yet the guilt for this is borne not by art's putative decline, but by the idea of art itself. Aesthetic nominalism is a process that transpires in the form and that ultimately becomes form. Even here, the universal and the particular are mediated. The nominalistic prohibitions on predefined forms are, as prescriptions, canonical. The critique of forms is entwined with the critique of their formal adequacy. Prototypical in this regard is the distinction between closed and open forms which is relevant to all theory of form. Open forms are those universal genre categories that seek an equilibrium with the nominalistic critique of, of universality that is founded on the experience that the unity of the universal and the particular, which is claimed by artworks, fundamentally fails. No pre-given universal unprotestingly receives a particular that does not derive from a genre. The perpetual universality of forms becomes incompatible with form's own meaning. The promise of something rounded, overarching, and balanced is not fulfilled. For this is a promise made to what is heterogeneous to the forms, which probably never tolerated identity with them. Forms that battle on after their moment is past do the form itself injustice. Form that has become reified with regard to its other is no longer form. The sense of form and Bach who in many regards opposed bourgeois nominalism, did not consist in showing respect for traditional forms, but rather in keeping them in motion, or better, in not letting them harden in the first place. Bach was nominalistic on the basis of his sense of form. A not unrancorous cliché praises the novel for its gift of form, yet the cliché has its justification in the novel's happy manipulation of forms not in the novel's happy manipulation of forms, but in its capacity for maintaining the liability of forms to what is formed, of yielding to it out of sensual sympathy rather than simply taming it. The sense for forms instructs on their problematic, that the beginning and end of a musical phrase, the balanced composition of a painting, stage rituals such as death or marriage of heroes are vain because they are arbitrary. What is shaped does not honor the form that shapes. If, however, the renunciation of ritual in the idea of an open genre, which is itself often conventional enough, like the rondo, is free of the live necessity, the idea of the genre becomes all the more exposed to contingency. The nominalistic artwork should become an artwork by being organized from below to above, not by having principles of organization foisted on it. But no artwork left blindly to itself possesses the power of organization that would set up binding boundaries for itself. Investing the work with such a power would in fact be fetishistic. 
unchecked aesthetic nominalism liquidates, just as philosophical critique does with regard to Aristotle, all forms as a remnant of a spiritual being in itself. It terminates in a literal facticity, and this is irreconcilable with art. In an artist with the incomparable level of form of Mozart, it would be possible to show how closely that artist's most daring and thus most authentic formal structures verge on nominalistic collapse. The artifactual character of the artwork is incompatible with the postulate of pure relinquishment to the material. By being something made, artworks acquire that element of organization of being something directed in the dramaturgical sense, sense that is anathema to the nominalistic sensibility. The historical aporia of aesthetic nominalism culminates in the insufficiency of open forms, a striking example of which is Brecht's difficulty in writing convincing conclusions to his plays. A qualitative leap in the general tendency is open, to open form is, moreover, not to be overlooked. The older open forms were based on traditional forms that they modified, but from which they maintained more than just the external trappings. The classical Viennese sonata was a dynamic yet, close, yet closed form, and this closure was precarious. The rondo, with the intentional freedom and the alternation of refrain and couplets, was a decidedly open form. All the same, in the fiber of what was composed, and the, the difference was not so substantial. From Beethoven to Mahler, the Sonata Rondo was much employed, which transplanted the development section of the Sonata to the Rondo, thus balancing off the playfulness of the open form with the bindingness of the closed form. This was possible because the Rondo form was itself never literally pledged to contingency, but rather in the spirit of a nominalistic age and in recollection of the much older spirit of the rounded canon, the alternation between choir and soloist adapted to the demand for an absence of constraint in an established form. The rondo left lent itself better to cheap standardization than did the dynamically developing sonata, whose dynamic, in spite of its closure, did not permit typification. The sense of form, which in the rondo at the very least gave the impression of contingency, required guarantees in order not to explode the genre. Antecedent forms in Bach, such as the presto of his Italian concerto, were more flexible, less rigid, more complexly elaborated than were Mozart's rondos, which belonged to a later stage of nominalism. The qualitative reversal occurred when, in place of the oxymoron of the open form, a new procedure appeared that, indifferent to the genres, completely followed the nominalistic commandment. Paradoxically, the results had better closure than their conciliatory predecessors. The nominalistic urge for authenticity resists the playful forms as descendants of feudal divertissement. The seriousness in Beethoven is bourgeois. Contingency impinged on form. Ultimately, contingency is a function of growing structuration. This explains apparently marginal events such as the temporally contracting scope of musical compositions, as well as the miniature format of Klee's best works. Resignation vis-a-vis -vis time and space gave ground to the crisis of nominalistic form until it was reduced to a mere point, effectively inert. Action painting, La Informelle, and aleatorical works may have carried the element of resignation to its extreme. The aesthetic subject exempts itself of the burden of giving form to the contingent material it encounters, despairing of the possibility of undergirding it, and instead shifts the responsibility for its organization back to the contingent material itself. The gain here is, however, dubious. Form purportedly distilled from the contingent and the heterogeneous itself remains heterogeneous and, for the artwork, arbitrary. In its literalness, it is alien to art. Stati statistics are used to console for the absence of traditional forms. This situation holds embedded in itself the figure of its own crit critique. Nominalistic artworks constantly require the intervention of the guiding hand they conceal in the service of their principle. The extremely objective critique of semblance incorporates an illusory element that is perhaps as irrevocable as the aesthetic semblance of all artworks. 
often in artistic products of chance and necessity is sensed to subordinate these art works to, effectively, a stylizing procedure of selection. Corriger la fortune. This is the faithful writing on the wall of the nominalistic artwork. Its fortune is nothing of the kind, but rather that fateful spell from which artworks have tried to extricate themselves ever since art lodged its claim against myth and antiquity. Beethoven's music, which was no less affected by nominalism than was Hegel's philosophy, is incomparable in that the intervention enjoined by the problematic of form is permeated with autonomy, that is, with the freedom of the subject that is coming to self-consciousness. He legitimated what, from the standpoint of the artwork that was to be developed entirely on its own terms, must have seemed like an act of coercion on the basis of its own content. No artwork is worthy of its name that would hold at bay what is accidental in terms of its own law of form. For form is, according to its own concept, the form of something, and this something must not be permitted to become merely the tautology of form. But the necessity of this relation of form to its other undermines form. Form cannot set itself up vis-a-vis -vis the heterogeneous as that purity that as form it wants to be just as much as it requires the heterogeneous. The imminence of form in the heterogeneous has its limits. Nevertheless, the history of the whole of bourgeois art was not possible except as the effort, if not to solve the antinomy of nominalism, then at least to give it shape, to win form from its negation. In this, the history of modern art is not merely analogous to the concept of philosophy, to the history of philosophy. It is the same history. What Hegel called the unfolding of truth occurred as the same process of unfolding both in art and philosophy. Interesting. The necessity of bringing about the objectivation of the nominalistic element, which this element at the same time resists, engenders the principle of construction. Construction is the form of works that is no longer imposed on them, ready-made, yet does not arise directly out of them either but rather originates in its reflection through subjective reason. Historically, the concept of construction originated in mathematics. It was applied to substantive concerns for the first time in Schelling's speculative philosophy, where it was to serve as the common denominator of the diffusely contingent and the need for form. The concept of construction in art comes close to this. Because art can no longer rely on any objectivity of universals, and yet by its own concept is nonetheless the objectivation of impulses, objectivation becomes functionalized. By demolishing the security of forms, nominalism made all art plein air long before this became an unmetaphoric slogan. Thinking and art both became dynamic. It is hardly an unfair overgeneralization to say that nominalistic art has a chance of objectivation only through imminent development through the processual character of every particular artwork. Dynamic objectivation, however, the determination of the work as existing in itself involves a static element. In construction, the dynamic reverses completely into the static. The constructed work stands still. Nominalism's progress thus reaches its own limit. In literature, the prototype of dynamization was intrigue. In music, the prototype was the development section. In Haydn's developments, a self-preoccupied busyness, opaque to itself in terms of its own purpose, became an objective determining basis of what is perceived as an expression of subjective humor. The individual activity of the motifs as they pursue their separate interests, all the while assured by a sort of residual ontology that through this activity they serve the harmony of the whole, is unmistakably reminiscent of the zealous, shrewd, and narrow-minded demeanor of intrigants, the descendants of the dumb devil. His dumbness infiltrates even the emphatic works of dynamic classicism, just as it lingers on in capitalism. The aesthetic function of such means was dynamically, through development, to confirm the process ignited by a unique element. The premises immediately posited by the work are fulfilled as its result. There's a kind of cunning of an unreason that strips the in 
intrigant of his narrow-mindedness. The tyrannical individual becomes the affirmation of the process. The reprise, peculiarly long-lived in the history of music, embodies to an equal degree affirmation and, as the repetition of what is essentially unrepeatable, limitation. Intrigue and development are not only subjective activity, temporal development for itself, they also represent unleashed, blind, and self-consuming life in the works. Against it, artworks are no longer a bulwark. Every intrigue, literally and figuratively, says, this is how things are, this is what it's like out there. In the portrayal of this commencé, the unwitting artwork is permeated by its other, its own essence, the movement toward objectivation, and is motivated by that heterogeneous other. This is possible because intrigue and development, which are subjective aesthetic means, when translated into the work, acquire that quality of subjective objectivation that they have in the external world. Go ahead. where they reproach social labor and its narrow-mindedness with its potential super superfluity. The superfluity is truly the point at which art coincides with the real world's business, to the extent to which a drama, itself a sonata-like product of the bourgeois era, is in musical terms worked, that is, dissected into the smallest motifs and objectivated in their dynamic synthesis, to this extent, and right into the most sublime moments, the echo of commodity production can be heard. The common nexus of these art technical procedures and material processes, which is developed in the course of industrialization, has yet to be clarified, but is nevertheless strikingly evident. With the emergence of intrigue and development, however, commodity production not only migrates into artworks in the form of heterogeneous life, but indeed also as their own law, Nominalistic artworks were unwitting tableau economique. This is the historical philosophical origin of modern humor. Certainly, it is through external industry that life is reproduced. It is a means to an end, but it subordinates all ends until it itself becomes an end in itself and truly absurd. This is recapitulated in art in that the intrigues, plots, and developments as well as the depravity and crime of detective novels, absorb all interest. By contrast, the conclusions to which they lead sink to the level of the stereotypical.
I'm sorry, my cat was uh, being sick. I'm just gonna try to get through this. He's fine now. He's old now. Go outside. Get out there. It's warm. This is the historical philosophical origin of modern humor. Certainly it is through external industry that life is reproduced, is a means to an end, that it subordinates, he's outside, that it subordinates all ends until it itself becomes an end in itself and truly absurd. This is recapitulated in art in that the intrigues, plots and developments, as well as the depravity and crime of detective novels absorb all interest. By contrast, the conclusions to which they lead sink to the level of the stereotypical. Thus, real industry, which by its own definition is only a for something, contradicts its own definition and becomes silly in itself and ridiculous for the artist. Through the form of his finales, Haydn, one of the greatest composers, showed the futility of the dynamics by which they are objectivated and did so in a way that became paradigmatical for art. This is the locus of whatever may justly be called humor in Beethoven. However, the more intrigue and dynamics became, become ends in themselves, intrigue already reached the level of thematic frenzy in Les, Lies, Les Liaisons Dangereux, the more comic do they become in art as well. And the more does the affect associated subjectively with this dynamic effectively become rage of the lost penny. It becomes the element of indifference and individuation. The dynamic principle by means of which art was long and insistently justified in hoping for homeostasis between the universal and the particular is rejected. Even the magic is shorn away by the sense for form. It begins to seem inept. This experience can be traced back to the middle of the 19th century. Baudelaire, the apologist of form no less than the poet of the Vie Moderne, expressed this in the dedication of Le Splin de Paris when he wrote that he can break off where he pleases, and so may the reader, for, quote, for I have not strung his wayward will to the endless thread of some unnecessary plot, end quote. What was organized by nominalistic art by means of development is stigmatized as superfluous once the intention of its function is recognized, and this becomes an irritant. With this comment, the chief figure of the whole of L'Art Polar effectively capitulates. His dégout extends to the dynamic principle that engenders the work as autonomous in itself. Since that moment, the law of all art has been its anti-law. Just as for the bourgeois nominalistic artwork, the necessity of a static form decayed. Here it is the aesthetic dynamic that decays in accord with the experience first formulated by Kernberger, but flashing up in each line and stanza of Baudelaire, that life no longer exists. This has not changed the situation in which contemporary art finds itself. Art's processual character has been overtaken by the critique of semblance and not merely as the critique of aesthetic universality, but rather as that of progress in the midst of what is ever the same. Process has been unmasked as repetition and, that has, art, and has thus become an embarrassment to art. Enciphered in modern art is the postulate of an art that no longer conforms to the disjunction of the static and dynamic. Beckett, indifferent to the ruling cliche of development, views his task as that of moving to an infinitely small space toward what is effectively a dimensionless point. This aesthetic principle of construction, as a principle of il faut continuer, goes beyond stasis, and it goes beyond the dynamic in that it is at the same time a principle of treading water and, as such, a confession of the uselessness of the dynamic. In keeping with this, all constructivistic techniques tend towards stasis, the telos of the dynamic of the ever same is disaster. Beckett's writings look this in the eye. Consciousness recognizes the limited, limitedness of limitless self-sufficient progress as an illusion of the absolute subject. And social labor aesthetically mocks bourgeois pathos once the superfluity 
of real labor came into reach. The dynamic in artworks is brought to a halt by the scope of the abolition of labor and the threat of a glacial death. Both are registered in the dynamic, which is unable to choose on its own. The potential of freedom manifest in it is at the same time denied by the social order and therefore is not substantial in art either. That explains the ambivalence of aesthetic construction. Construction is equally able to codify the resignation of the weakened subject and to make absolute alienation the sole concern of art, which, was once, want, which once wanted the opposite, as it is able to anticipate a reconciled condition that would itself be situated beyond static and dynamic. The many interrelations with technocracy, with technocracy give reason to suspect the that the principle of construction remains aesthetically obedient to the administered world, but it may terminate in a yet unknown aesthetic form whose rational organization might point to the abolition of all categories of administration along with their reflexes in art. Prior to the emancipation of the subject, art was undoubtedly in a certain sense more immediately social than it was afterward. Its autonomy, its growing independence from society was a function of the bourgeois consciousness of freedom that was itself bound up with the social structure. Prior to the emergence of this consciousness, art certainly stood in opposition to social domination and its mores, but not with an awareness of its own independence. There had been conflicts between art and society desultorily ever since art was condemned in Plato's state but the idea of a fundamentally oppositional art was inconceivable and social controls worked much more immediately than in the bourgeois era until the rise of totalitarian states. On the other hand, the bourgeoisie integrated art much more completely than any previous society had. Under the pressure of an intensifying nominalism, the ever present yet latent social character of art was made increasingly manifest. This social character is incomparably more evident in the novel than it was in the highly stylized and remote epics of chivalry. The influx of experiences that are no longer forced into a priori genres, the requirement of constituting form out of these experiences that is from below, this is realistic in purely aesthetic terms, regardless of content. Shh, Big Daddy. This is realistic in purely aesthetic terms, regardless of content. No longer sublimated by the principle of stylization, the relation of content to the society from which it derives at first becomes much less refracted, and this not only in the case of literature. The so-called lower genres too whole held their distance from society, even when, like Attic comedy, they made bourgeois relations and the events of daily life thematic. The flight into no man's land is not just one of Aristophanes's antics, but rather an essential element of his form. If, in one regard, as a product of the social labor of spirit, art is always implicitly a fait social, in becoming bourgeois art, its social aspect was made explicit. The object of bourgeois art is the relation of itself as artifact to empirical society. Don Quixote stands at the beginning of this development. Art, however, is social not only because of its mode of production, in which the dialectic of the forces and re relations of production is concentrated, nor simply because of the social derivation of its thematic material. Much more importantly, art becomes social by its opposition to society, and it occupies this position only as autonomous art. By crystallizing in itself as something unique to itself, rather than complying with existing social norms and qualifying as socially useful, it criticizes society by merely existing, for which Puritans of all stripes condemn it. 
There is nothing pure, nothing structured strictly according to its own imminent law that does not implicitly criticize the debasement of a situation evolving in the direction of a total exchange society in which everything is heteronymously defined. Art's asociality is the determinate negation of a determinate society. Certainly through its refusal of society, which is equivalent to sublimation through the law of form, autonomous art makes itself a vehicle of ideology. The society at which it shudders is left in the distance, undisturbed. Yet this is more than ideology. Society is not only the negativity that the aesthetic law of form condemns, but also, even in its most objectionable shape, the quintessence of self-producing and self-reproducing human life. Art was no more able to dispense with this element than with the critique until that moment when the social process revealed itself as one of self-annihilation. And it is not in the power of art, which does not make judgments, to separate these two elements intentionally. A pure productive force such as that of the aesthetic, once freed from heteronymous control, is objectively the counterimage of enchained forces, but is also the paradigm of fateful Big Daddy. but it is also the paradigm of fateful, self-interested doings. Art keeps itself alive through its social force of resistance, unless it reifies, its, reifies itself, it becomes a commodity. Its contribution to society is not communication with it, but rather something extremely mediated it is resistance, oh my God. It is resistance in which by virtue of inner aesthetic development, social development is reproduced without being imitated. At the risk of its self-alienation, radical modernity preserves art's eminence by admitting society only in an obscured form. Let's make a mess. Radical modernity preserves art's imminence by admitting society only in an obscured form, as in the dreams with which artworks have always been compared. Nothing social in art is immediately social, not even when this is its aim. Not long ago, even the socially committed Brecht found that to give his political position artistic expression, it was necessary to distance him himself precisely from that social reality at which his works took aim. Jesuitical machinations were needed sufficiently to camouflage what he wrote as socialist realism to escape the Inquisition. Music betrays all art, just as in music, society, its movement, and its contradictions appear only in shadowy fashion, speaking out of it, indeed, yet in need of identification. So it is with all other arts. Whenever art seems to copy society, it becomes all the more an as if. For opposite reasons, Brecht's China in the Good Woman of Szechuan is no less stylized than Schiller's Messina in The Bride of Messina. All moral judgments on the characters in novels or plays have been senseless, even when these judgments have justly taken the empirical figures back of the work as their targets. Discussions about whether a positive hero can have negative traits are as foolish as they sound to anyone who overhears them from so much as the slightest remove. Forms work, form works like a magnet that orders elements of the empirical world in such a fashion that they are, are estranged from their extra aesthetic existence. And it is only as a result of this estrangement that they master the extra aesthetic essence. Conversely, by exploiting these elements, the culture industry all the more successful, successfully joins slavish respect for empirical detail, the gapless semblance of photographic fidelity, 
with ideological manipulation. What is social in art is its imminent movement against society, not its manifest opinions. Its historical gesture repels empirical reality, of which artworks are nevertheless part in that they are things. Insofar as a social function can be predicated for artworks, it is their functionlessness. Through their difference from a bewitched reality, they embody negatively a position in which what is would have would find its rightful place, its own. Their enchantment is disenchantment. The social essence requires a double reflection on their being for themselves and on their relations to society. Their double character is manifest at every point. They change and contradict themselves. It was plausible that socially progressive critics should have accused the program of la pour la, which has often been in league with political reaction of promoting a fetish with the concept of a pure, exclusively self-sufficient artwork. What is true in this accusation is that artworks, products of social labor that are subject to or produce their own law of form, seal themselves off from what they themselves are. To this extent, each artwork could be charged with false consciousness and chalked up to ideology. In formal terms, independent of what they say, they are ideology in that a priori they posit something spiritual as being independent from the conditions of its material production and therefore as being intrinsically superior and beyond the primordial guilt of the separation of physical and spiritual labor. What is exalted on the basis of this guilt is at the same time debased by it. This is why artworks with truth content do not blend seamlessly with the concept of art. La pour la theorists, like Valérie, have pointed this out. But the guilt they bear of fetishism does not disqualify art any more so than it disqualifies anything culpable. For in the universally, socially mediated world, nothing stands external to its nexus of guilt. The truth content of artworks, which is indeed their social truth, is predicated on their fetish character, the principle of heteronomy. Apparently, the counterpart of fetishism is the principle of exchange, and in it, domination is masked. Only what does not submit to that principle acts as the plenipotentiary of what is free from domination. Only what is useless can stand in for the stunted use value. Artworks are plenipotentiaries of things that are no longer distorted by exchange, profit, and the false needs of a degraded humanity. In the context of total semblance, art's semblance of being in itself is the mask of truth. Marx's scorn of the pittance Milton received for Paradise Lost, a work that did not appear to the market as socially useful labor, is, as a denunciation of useful labor, the strongest defense of art against its bourgeois functionalization, which is perpetuated in art's undialectical social condemnation. A liberated society would be beyond the irrationality of its faux frais and beyond the ends means rationality of utility. This is enciphered in art and is the source of art's social explosiveness. Although the magic fetishes are one of the historical roots of art, a fetishistic element remains admixed in artworks, an element that goes beyond commodity fetishism. Artworks can neither exclude nor deny this. Even socially, the emphatic elements of semblance in artworks is, as a corrective, the organon of truth. Artworks that do not insist fetishistically on their coherence, as if they were the absolute that they are unable to be, are worthless from the start. But the survival of art becomes precarious as soon as it becomes conscious of its fetishism and, as has been the case since the middle of the 19th century, insists obstinately on it. Art cannot advocate delusion by insisting that otherwise art would not exist. This forces, forces art into an aporia. All that succeeds in going even minutely beyond it is insight into the rationality of its irrationality. Artworks that want to divest themselves of fetishism by real and extremely dubious political commitment regularly enmesh themselves in false consciousness as the result of inevitable and vainly praised simplification. In the short-sighted praxis to which they blindly subscribe, their own blindness is prolonged. All right, that's it for now. See you next time.